Welcome to my channel, Detailing Events Throughout the Decades, 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger On January 28, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger broke apart just 73 seconds after blasting off from Florida's Kennedy Space Center. The Space Shuttle disintegrated over the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of Cape Canaveral, Florida, at around 11.39 in the morning. The disintegration of the Challenger began after a joint in its right solid rocket booster failed at liftoff. The failure was caused by no ring seal, used in the joint, that were not designed to handle the unusually cold conditions that existed at the launch. The seal's failure, caused a breach in the solid rocket booster's joint, allowing pressurized burning gas form within the solid rocket motor to reach the outside, and impinge upon the adjacent solid rocket booster at the filled joint attachment hardware and external fuel tank. This led to the separation of the right-hand solid rocket booster's field joint attachment and the structural failure of the external tank. All seven astronauts on board were killed, including teacher Krista McAuliffe, a civilian who had been selected to fly via NASA's Teacher in Space program. The crew compartment and other shuttle fragments were eventually recovered from the ocean floor, after a lengthy search and recovery operation. The exact time of the death of the crew is unknown, but it is thought that several crew members had survived the initial breakup of the shuttle. The shuttle had no escape system. The impact of the crew compartment at terminal velocity with the ocean surface was too violent for anyone to survive. The whole world was watching the launch at the time, and were in complete shock at what they had witnessed. Around 17% of Americans were at the launch because of the presence of Krista McAuliffe who was the first teacher to go into space. Media coverage was extensive, and it had actually been the first time that the United States had lost a space shuttle with crew on board. Each of the space shuttle's two solid rocket boosters were constructed of seven sections, six of which were permanently joined in pairs at the factory. For each flight, the four resulting segments were then assembled in the shuttle's assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center, with three field joints. The factory joints were sealed with asbestos silica insulation, applied over the joint, while each field joint was sealed with two rubber O-rings. After the destruction of the Challenger, the number of O-rings per field joint was increased to three. The seals of all the solid rocket boosters were required to contain the hot, high-pressure gases produced by the burning solid propellant inside. Engineers at the Marshall Space Flight Center wrote to the manager of the Solid Rocket Booster Project, George Hardy on several occasions before the Challenger disaster, suggesting that Thiokol's field joint design was unacceptable. It was suggested that joint rotation would render the secondary O-rings useless. These memos were never forwarded to Thiokol, and the field joints were accepted for flight in 1980. Evidence of serious O-ring erosion was present as early as the second space shuttle mission STS-2 which was flown by Columbia. The Challenger Space Shuttle mission was originally set to launch on January 22, but it was moved to January 23 and then to January 24. This was then scheduled again to January 25, due to bad weather. However, this was again rescheduled to January 27. The launch was then delayed till the next day due to problems with the exterior access hatch. Forecasts for January 28 predicted an unusually cold morning. The shuttle was never certified to operate in temperatures that low. The O-ring as well as many other critical components had no test data to support any expectation of a successful launch in such conditions. Ice had accumulated all over the launch pad, raising concerns that ice could damage the shuttle upon liftoff. The Kennedy ICE team inadvertently pointed an infrared camera at the field joint of the right solid rocket booster, and found the temperature to be minus 13. This was believed to be the result of supercooled air blowing on the joint from the liquid oxygen tank vent. The Challenger shuttle was cleared to launch at 11.38 that morning. On the morning of the disaster, the primary O-ring had become so hard, due to the cold, that it could not seal in time. The temperature had dropped below the glass transition temperature of the O-rings. Above the glass transition temperature, 
the O-rings display properties of elasticity and flexibility. The secondary O-ring was not in its seated position due to the metal bending. There was now, no barrier to the gases and both O-rings were vaporized across 70 degrees of arc. Aluminium oxides from the burn solid propellant sealed the damaged joint, temporarily replacing the O-ring seal before flames passed through the joint. Beginning at T37 and 27 seconds, the shuttle experienced a series of wind shear that was stronger than on any previous flight. At T58, a tracking camera captured the beginning of a plume of smoke on the right solid rocket booster. Unknown to those on board or to Houston, hot gas now began to leak through a growing hole in one of the right-hand solid rocket booster joints. The force of the wind shear shattered the temporary oxide seal that had taken the place of the damaged O-rings, removing the last barrier for flame passing through the joint. The shuttle began to launch. When the Challenger got to 48,000 feet, it veered from its correct attitude. The crew cabin was made of reinforced aluminium, and was a particular robust section of the orbiter. As the Challenger broke up, the crew cabin detached in one piece and slowly tumbled into a ballistic arc. Within 10 seconds the cabin was in free fall. At least some of the crew were alive at the time, and briefly conscious. Three of the four recovered personal egress air packs on the flight deck were found to have been activated. These were those of Judy Thresnick, Ellison Onizuka and pilot Michael J. Smith. Analyzing the wreckage, investigators discovered that several electrical system switches on pilot Michael Smith's right-hand panel had been moved from their usual launch positions. According to fellow astronaut, Richard Mullen, these switches were protected with lever locks that requires them to be pulled outward against a spring force, before they can be moved to a new position. Later tests revealed that neither the force of the explosion, nor the impact with the ocean could have moved them, which indicated that Michael Smith made the switch changes, presumably in an attempt to restore electrical power to the cockpit, after the cabin detached from the rest of the orbiter. Whether the crew members remained conscious long after the breakup is unknown. Recovery of the cabin found that the mid-deck floor had not suffered buckling or tearing, as a result from a rapid decompression, thus providing some evidence that the depressurization may have not happened all at once. It is thought that the cabin hit the ocean surface at roughly 207 miles per hour, beyond survivability levels. The crew would have been torn from their seats and killed instantly, by the extreme impact force. Not all crew members could be identified due to the poor conditions of their bodies from salt water. Judy Thresnick, Dick Scobby and Captain Michael J. Smith were buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Ellison Onizuka was buried at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific in Honolulu, Hawaii. Ronald McNair was buried in Rest Lawn Memorial Park, in Lake City, South Carolina. Krista McAuliffe was buried at Calvary Cemetery, in her hometown of Concord, New Hampshire. Gregory Jarvis, was cremated, and his ashes scattered in the Pacific Ocean. Those unidentified crew members, were buried communally at the Space Shuttle Challenger Memorial in Arlington, on May 20, 1986. After the accident, NASA was criticized for its lack of openness with the press. Further shuttle flights were suspended, pending the results of the Rogers Commission investigation into the accident. NASA's space shuttle fleet were grounded for almost three years, while investigations were taking place. On September 29, 1988, Space Shuttle Discovery lifted off with a crew of five. On the night of the disaster, President Ronald Reagan had been scheduled to give his annual State of Union address. The address was postponed for a week, and instead he gave a national address on the Challenger disaster from the Oval Office at the White House. Three days later, President Ronald Reagan and his wife Nancy, traveled to the Johnson Space Center to speak at a memorial service honoring the crew members. It was attended by 6,000 NASA employees and 4,000 guests, as well as family of the crew. During the ceremony, an Air Force band led the singing of God Bless America as NASA T-38 Talon jets flew directly over the scene, in the traditional, missing man formation. This was broadcast on television. 
The astronauts' names are among those of several other astronauts and cosmonauts who have died in the line of duty, listed on the Space Mirror Memorial, at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex in Merritt Island, Florida. The families of the Challenger crew organized the Challenger Center for Space Science Education, as a permanent memorial to the crew. Fifty-two learning centers have been established by this nonprofit organization. Forever remembering the crew of the Challenger Space Shuttle. May you never be forgotten. Thank you for watching and learning about events throughout history. Please subscribe to my channel, to view other events which have taken place throughout the decades.